welcome to Coast. Uh, we're going to be talking about the role that joy plays in our lives, the role that joy plays in our lives. Um, I think this Advent season invites a simple question for us. How can we be joyful people? How can we be joyful people? But before we dive in, I want you to take 30 seconds and I want you to turn to your neighbor and share what you are most excited about in 2019. Dude, guys, it's like two weeks away. Isn't that crazy? Like 2019 is like literally like two and a half weeks away. It's, it's kind of insane. Take 30 seconds a minute, turn to your neighbor and share what's one thing you're genuinely excited about in 2019. Okay, let's bring it back. Can we get a few people? Raise your hands. I want to hear a few answers. What are you most excited about in 2019? Let's get a few answers. Raise your hand. I'll be happy to pick on you. Anyone? Who wants to go first? A few volunteers, please. Anyone? Uh, Andy, what are you most excited about in 2019? Health insurance. All right. Cool. What else? What else do we have? Most excited about in 2019? Any other answers? Just shout it out. Anyone? What did your neighbor share? <laughs> Avengers Endgame. Avengers Endgame. <laughs> cool. That's a movie. That's a great movie. Most watched trailer in 24 hours on YouTube ever. Um, cool. Anyone else? One more answer. Most ex the thing you're most excited about in 2019? Following, Following God's direction. That's awesome. Cool. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that we can think about. If you haven't yet thought about 2019, it's literally around the corner. And I think it's a great time. You know, this Advent season, yes, in preparation for Jesus, but it's also a great time to anticipate uh, and look forward to some things that God might want to do in 2019 for you. Um, about three years ago, um, around Christmas time, actually, literally a week from, you know, next week, but three years ago, um, Christmas Day, um, uh, a few of us went over to Audrey and Benson's house, a couple members here at Coast Vineyard, and we had dinner. Um, Benson had made this amazing prime rib that had been roasting for hours. We had roasted vegetables, I think we had mashed potatoes, and we had dessert, and it was just such a sweet time to have Christmas dinner with friends in San Diego, especially for those that couldn't make it home during that Christmas. During dinner, uh, one of the attendees um, at, their, at their house was Andy Chen, and um, we were just having a lot of small chat um, during dinner, and we look around, he kind of looks around, he's like, hey guys, like, what are you most excited about for 2016, which was, you know, a month later at that time. And I was the first to respond, instinctually, for the record, everyone in that room, there's about like, I think maybe eight to nine of us, um, everyone in the room was expecting me to say, my wedding, which was three weeks later, in 2000, January 2016. Instead, in a heartbeat, when Andy asked, David, what are you most excited about in 2016, the most exciting events that you're looking forward to? I said, Captain America Civil War. <laughs> Captain America Civil War. My wife glared at me, and everyone looked at me, and it ended up becoming a different kind of civil war, guys. A different kind of civil war happened here. Tony Lynn, shout out where you at. Thank you. Oh, that was Grace. Grace, thank you for that photo. Um, <laughs> um, they all, everyone was teasing me, even, even at the wedding when Jason was presiding and officiating. He teased me too. And even three years later, I'm still making up for it with my wife. I don't know why, but my anticipation for Marvel movies in particular, I love that Grace said Avengers Endgame. Um, my anticipation for Marvel movies governed my thoughts, my feelings, and my desires, and the things I said. Um, and apparently not my own wedding. <laughs> so uh, my wife is so forgiving for that, I think. Um, so I think it's kind of funny. During Advent, when we talk about joy, I think a lot of us relate to joy in the dimension of anticipation. We think about, well, we're expecting Jesus' birth, so therefore we should be joyful. Um, today, and that seems pretty straightforward, right? But today, um, I want to shift into different dimensions of joy around Advent that we have not yet explored before. And here's the big idea that I want us to touch upon today. I think as followers of Jesus we can experience joy 
every single day for the rest of our lives. Every single day for the rest of our lives. I think it can be an ongoing expression of how we follow Jesus. So church, write that down. That's the big idea for today. The big question then is, how can we be joyful people? Is it just about looking forward to that event or that movie or that wedding or being able to spend time with family? Is it just one month out of the year that we are giving permission by popular culture to be joyful people? And I think the answer is no. I think God is inviting us to be joyful people every single month of the year, every single day of the year. So before we dive into the scriptures, we need to define some things first. What is joy? Joy is a natural result of our relationship with God. Galatians 5 says joy is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. To remove the Christian needs from that, joy is a natural result, a natural result of our relationship with God. When relationships deepen, of course it doesn't mean that you know, there's an a, you know, absence of a conflict or an absence of sadness or pain or struggle, But joy, as we know it biblically, is a natural result of our relationship with God. I think you guys have heard of the phrase, I've got joy deep down in my soul. I mean, we've sung it on stage a couple times too. And there's a truth and a rhyme and a reason to it. I've got joy deep down in my soul. Here's something kind of interesting. Before we actually dive into scriptures, we're going to talk about joy a little bit more. And I'm going to set up a framework for you that Dallas Willard, um, bless his soul, he passed away. Um, uh, he's a theologian, and he talks in, the, in Renovation of the Heart and a few, and a few, of, a few of, of his other materials. He talks about this framework of what the soul is. In order for us to understand and let joy literally come deep down into our soul, we have to understand what the heck does that mean. So here's a framework to get started. So when we look at scriptures, there's different ways to look at the heart. Right? We, we often talk about, well, I got joy in my heart. I got joy deep down in my soul. But what does that mean? What is the soul? What is the heart? We're going to have time to delve into all of that and look at all the scriptures for that. But um, Dallas Willer offers a, a fairly straightforward and clear framework that have, have, that have helped me understand joy. Joy, the biblical trifecta, for the soul and how we can experience joy in all of its aspects consists of our thoughts, our feelings, and our will. That means that in order to experience joy deep down in our soul, we need to understand the following. Thoughts, emotions, and will. Check it. We cannot experience joy, the emotion of joy, without having a belief, a truth, an idea, an upcoming event, an expectation, or a memory that triggers that emotion. Like, I can't turn to Debbie or Patrick or Daniel or Jason or Brian and say, hey, I feel joy right now. Just feel it. Just do it. You can't just concoct it out of nothing. There has to be a particular event or circumstance or a joke or a funny story that triggers the emotion of joy. These thoughts trigger feelings we often associate with joy, right? Happiness, glee, pleasure, ecstasy. Lastly, joy, by definition, as we look at at in scriptures, cannot exist without intention or desire. Joy isn't bound to happenstance. Joy isn't bound to the thing. Joy is not created by just because Circumstances happen to us, and boom, we're just happy. Joy is an output, as defined earlier, from an intentional, willful relationship with God. And let me share, let me kind of set up some ground rules for a conversa- conversation around joy. In the area of mental health or social work, I recognize that this topic of joy, can, it may almost feel formulaic. I am not proposing a formula for joy. I'm not saying, hey, if you follow these things based on the scriptures that we see now, boom, you're going to be a joyful person. I acknowledge that mental health is real, that there's different resources to address that. I also acknowledge that um, there isn't, you know, just, there isn't, a, there isn't a, 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 a causation effect here. 
that just because we follow Jesus or have healthy theology, correct theology, correct theology of who God is, doesn't mean that we're going to experience joy all the time. Following Jesus is difficult, and we acknowledge that. But I think there are some things that we can learn from the scriptures I'm about to share in a little bit about how we can experience joy based on Zechariah's and Elizabeth's life. Cool. So, um, uh, where did I go? Okay. That says Zechariah and Elizabeth. We'll dive into that a little bit. Um, I'm going to read this quote from Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard says, The soul is the hidden or spiritual side of the person. It includes an individual's thoughts and feelings, along with heart or will, with its intents and choices. It also includes an individual's bodily life and social relations, which in their inner meaning and nature are just as hidden as the thoughts and feelings. Together, all of these things make up the real person. The good tree, Jesus said, bears good fruit. If we tend to the tree, our rela- if we tend to our relationship with God, Dallas Word says the fruit will take care of itself. So we cannot talk about joy biblically or as followers of Jesus without talking about, well, what's your relationship with God and how you're taking care of that. Cool? So as you can recall from the last few Sundays, um, the story of Jesus' birth runs parallel with that of John the Baptist's birth. Um, John's birth begins with a priest named Zechariah, along with his wife Elizabeth. They devoted themselves to God, living blamelessly, let me go back to this photo, before others. But here's the thing, Elizabeth was barren, unable to conceive due to her old age, and then we find out earlier on the scriptures in Luke uh, 1 that an angel appears to Zechariah telling him that he and Elizabeth are going to have a son, John the Baptist. The son's name is to be John, and he's going to bring many Israelites back to God. But here's the thing, Zechariah doubts the angel's words. He says, how am I supposed to believe that? What happens next is interesting. The angel turns to Zechariah and says, hey, we're, this prophecy is still going to come true, but because you doubted me, you're not going to be able to speak. So he mutes Zechariah, literally. Mutes Zechariah, literally. And then what happens after that is Zechariah is mute. He comes home, and as far as we know, you know, they conceive a baby, um, and then gestation period and pregnancy, and then John is born. So, and this is where we're at now. Cool. So let's read Luke 1. When it was time for Elizabeth to have, oh, just remember real quick, Zechariah is still mute. Okay, cool. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, heck no, he is going to be called John. And they said to her, but there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Let's keep reading. Well, then they, the community, instead of listening to Elizabeth, so this is key, instead of listening to Elizabeth or believing the prophecy of the angel Gabriel, they do this next. The community made signs to the father, remember he's mute, made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child. Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with John. And then... um, uh, verse 7, there's uh, the last verse there. I don't actually wrap it up. What happens next is his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And kind of similar to kind of Mary's song that um, Amy spoke about a couple weeks ago, Zechariah actually writes and, and just sings and praises God for many, many verses. And you can see the rest of that in the remainder of, of Luke chapter 1. Um, So I pulled a couple of these images from Google just to kind of give you an idea of uh, the situation and and, and make this scene a bit more tangible for you. 
So here's an older couple who had little to zero chance of conceiving, becoming pregnant and delivering a son. Their community celebrated with them, and they shared in Elizabeth's and Zachariah's joy. Eight days after the baby was born, Evren gathers for a ceremony of circumcision, which was common during that time. And similar to our American culture, however, the Jewish norm was to name the baby at birth, but the public ceremony offered an exception here, a special occasion of sorts, just because Zechariah, he's a holy priest, and this is a big deal. So the community actually planned to name the baby Zechariah. But as you can see here, Elizabeth held fast to what the angel Gabriel had dictated earlier. The baby's name is supposed to be John. Imagine where Elizabeth is at right now. She, know, she believes Zechariah's encounter with the angel Gabriel. She believes him. They become pregnant. Oh my God, that's check number one. We're pregnant. That's a miracle. That's amazing. Let's believe the rest of the prophecy. The rest of the prophecy says that you got to name your baby John, and he's going to change the world. So when it came time to name the baby, she's persistent. She's like, we're going to name this baby John because that's what this messenger told us the baby's name should be. But here's, here, just to kind of catch you guys up, it, what happened the, the previous nine months during pregnancy? Do you think Elizabeth and Zachary didn't tell them that? Of course the community already knew for the past nine to 12 months, ever since the encounter, most likely that the full prophecy said that the name should be John. So the issue, and I don't mind just feel like, well, it's just a, you know, this feels like a peripheral issue. It's just about baby names. But for the purpose of what is happening here, the baby's name matters. The baby's name matters. The community did not jump on board with the name. Cultural norms for the community dictated two things. Well, we got to use a name from the existing book of names from your family tree. Or two, the father-husband's opinion, you know, given kind of the patriarchal nature of how decisions might be made, the patriarchal nature or norm meant that, hey, uh, Elizabeth, we're not going to go with you. We're going to go check with Zachariah instead. So what can we learn from this passage? And there's a few insights, and you can look at it um, in your bulletin and follow along with me there. So insight number one is this. This has to do with the community. Our bias, our biases may limit our ability to see God's purposes. Our bias may limit our ability to see God's purposes. So if you guys remember, the, the big question today is how can we be joyful people? Well, if joy is dependent on our ability to see God's purposes and engage with God's purposes, purposes because there's joy there, then are there biases, blind spots in our lives that may prevent us from seeing God's purposes? Meaning, are you missing out on joy in your life because of your narrow-mindedness or a narrow heart with which you're approaching life, just as the community may be doing so? While Elizabeth's community believed in the miraculous conception, they didn't believe the entire prophecy. Elizabeth, as I mentioned earlier, would have and most likely did share the entirety of the prophecy of Andrew Gabriel with her closest friends, families, and neighbors. But in a spirit of disregard from the community, they reacted to Elizabeth's persistence about her son's name with the resounding, nope, we're going to go check with Zechariah instead, even though most likely Zechariah said the same thing the whole time, right? Most likely during those nine months, he also shared the same thing with that community. So here's a takeaway. Sometimes, sometimes I think our cultural biases, how things ought to be done, can prevent us from seeing God's purposes for our lives. Um, uh, back in, uh, in my early 20s, <laughs> it feels a long time ago, <laughs> back in my early 20s, um, uh, I had this roommate named Brian. And uh, um, every time we would talk to Brian, he has got to be one of the most cynical people I have ever ever met. Have you, can you guys think of any single people in your life where you just, you just feel like there's such an absence of joy in their life? 
And when I sit down with Brian, when he's going through a rough time, and you can tell he's kind of in his zone, and he's worse than normal, than his normal cynicism, normal kind of worse, um, when I would sit down with him, he would often talk about, yeah, my dad, I don't know where he's at, but he's in Vietnam somewhere, and he's not going to take care of the family. Yeah, my mom and sister are struggling with finances. And there's just a list of things that he would often bring up when I would check in with him. And every time I would listen to him, I felt like the Lord would just tell me, hey, just invite Brian to forgive his dad. You know, things don't have to be perfect or fully reconciled, but just invite Brian to forgive his dad. Or invite, or invite Brian to see things a little bit differently so that he's not robbed of the joy that I think God might want to give him. You know, life doesn't have to be perfect, but I think you can experience God's joy today. You know, and um, I wasn't even asking him to, like, come to faith or anything. I was just asking him, hey, like, maybe consider the situation a little bit differently and just receive it so you don't let that unforgiveness rob you of the joy that God wants to give you. And his response every single time, every single time I talked to Brian, and I would just try to love him, invite him to see something a different way, he would always say, well, David, you'll never understand. And that was that. That was his response. And he just went back to looking down to whatever he was working on and left the conversation on that every single time. I've, I've had at least 20 plus conversations with him as his roommate about kind of stuff in his life that he would open up to open up with me about. And I just, I just can't help but think, what are the biases, our way of doing things, our way of seeing life that actually might prevent us, our blinds that prevent us from seeing God's purposes for our lives that ultimately robs us of joy. So where in your life where in your life do you feel like there might be blind spots? And you know a good place to start is ask your friends. Ask people in this room. Because <laughs> they're blind spots. You're not going to be able to see it yourself. And I have, I've had so many friends over the past 10 years of being here at Coast that have invited me to see things differently. And, it, and there's been joy that comes forth from that. So what's another thing that we can learn from this story? Another thing we learn from this story is learning to be joyful begins with healthy theology. And I'll explain what that means in a second. What we believe about God shapes our intentions, actions, and emotions. Learning to be joyful begins with how we actually understand God. Learning to be joyful begins with how we understand God because our thought life, what we believe about God, shapes our intentions, our actions, and our emotions. Elizabeth's theology... She believed the angel Gabriel. She believed God for what he said he was going to do and what, who he said he was. Elizabeth's theology led her on a path of faithfulness. She believed the angel Gabriel. She believed the baby's name would be John. She believed the baby would be filled with the Holy Spirit, which we find out later that when she saw Mary, we found out earlier in the story that when, when she in, interacted with Mary, John felt Jesus' presence in Mary's womb, right? You guys remember that story? And then the baby what? Leapt for joy. Leapt for joy. And that was actually part of the prophecy that the angel Gabriel was speaking to Elizabeth. The baby would be filled with the Holy Spirit while in her womb. Elizabeth also believed that one day John would turn the hearts of many. And because of that, Elizabeth, because of her theology, how she saw God and what she actually believed, Elizabeth experienced the fullness of God's promise for who God said he was and what God said he would do. However, on the other hand, look at Zechariah. Zechariah was literally, literally kept from praise because he chose not to believe. He chose not to believe. Where there's belief in one hand, Elizabeth's theology was, I believe God, and I believe the prophecy. Zechariah, on the other hand, exhibited unbelief. And his unbelief led to his muteness. It doesn't mean that obviously during those nine months he had no joy that the baby, you know, was just, the baby was in the womb, the baby was growing. It didn't mean that. It just meant that Elizabeth, because of how she viewed God, she was able to more fully experience joy. So what does that mean for us? If my understanding of the scriptures is accurate, I'm pretty sure Jesus shared that we could do all the things he could do and so much more. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed for the sick. I pray for people with cancer. I pray for Rob and Kelly's baby. 
I pray for so many people in Southeast Asia. I pray for my grandma. I pray for so many people over physical healing. Why? Because the gospel is telling me that that's possible. My theology should be shaped not by, not by my experience of what I see in the scriptures. But I can't tell you how many times I've gotten to a place of discouragement and despair. And I think the reality is this. I think our theology is often shaped our theology is often shaped by not what Jesus tells us is possible, what we see in the Acts of the Apostles, or what we see in the Gospels, right? Our theology, if you were to be honest with ourselves, let's be honest. Do you believe that God can heal the sick people in your life, for example? I'm just making that up. You know, give an example. For me, I'm, I'm kind of 50-50. I'm like, well, I've seen some pretty miraculous stuff, but I've also been really discouraged. So God, my theology is more somewhere in the middle. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, the already but not yet that kind of the vineyard teaches about. But when we look at the scriptures, what does it dictate? And um, I want to invite you to just consider, just consider how is your theology formed? Is it by your experiences or lack of experiences? Or is it by what God says he wants to do in the scriptures? What do the scriptures say? What does Jesus say about us and how we follow Jesus and how the kingdom of God should be breaking through in our lives? And are you still pursuing those things? Just the way that, just the way that Elizabeth was persistent. So I'm going to go to insight number three. What's the third thing that we can learn? Um, faith cultivates our relationship with the Holy Spirit. During her pregnancy, as we learned earlier, Elizabeth felt John leaping for joy in her room when she came in contact with Jesus. Zachariah, after he chose to actually write down the name John, because he's like, yeah, it's actually named John. I'm not going to disagree with my wife anymore, disagree with the prophecy. It's actually named John. What happens? He's completely healed of his muteness. He chose to believe God for who God said he was and what God said God would do. And he experienced complete joy. And in both of these instances, we see the Holy Spirit and joy go hand in hand. An encounter with the Holy Spirit leads to the fruits of the Holy Spirit, as we talked about earlier. Joy. So real biblical joy, guys, real biblical joy isn't born from comfort or security. Real biblical joy, I say biblical like it's a book, I say like literally the joy that God says he wants to have for us, it isn't born from comfort or security. Do you think Elizabeth felt safe and the whole community said, nope, you're going to name, no, I don't care if you're the mother of the baby, we're going to name it whatever, whatever we wanted to name it. Could you imagine how, what she's thinking in that moment? She's frustrated, but she was persistent. She took an act of faith and said, no, it's still going to be named John. Real biblical joy is developed through risk-taking. And guys, there isn't no perfect formula for joy. There isn't some perfect formula for joy. But I can tell you this, some of the elements are here. It's found right here. That in order to really experience the joy that God wants to give us, we have to take risk. Take steps of significance, not steps of safety. In terms of how we make decisions about our lives and our families' lives, right? Um, worship team. And prayer team coming up. So, joy is the natural result of us pursuing a deeper relationship with God, of taking big risk in our relationship with God. And so, for some of you who might be asking, well, David, what does that practically look like? How can I take practical steps in my life to open up my relationship with God so I can experience joy more? So, here are some steps you can take. If joy comes from a deep relationship with God, you have to build habits that you have to build habits that help you believe God's purposes for your life. In order to experience joy, you have to build habits. Build habits that help you believe God's purposes for your life. So, what are these? Some of these habits you could do. Um, you can practice being in the presence of God. Hike, journal, meditate, read. Practice being God's presence. Elizabeth and Zachariah spent time, time devoted to God, time in prayer. Practice being God's presence. Hike, 
journal, meditate, read. Another step you can take is eat meals often with friends and family. Jesus modeled relationship for us, right? What was, the, what was one of the primary contacts with which he engaged with his disciples, with people and sinners? The table, literally a meal with people. Do you guys know that 60 years ago from the Journal of Adolescent Health, we learned this. 60 years ago, the average meal time with your family was 90 minutes. The average time spent sitting down with family members or friends was 90 minutes. Today, the average meal time spent with family and friends is 12 minutes. If you want to cultivate joy in your life, have a meal with someone. A third piece is pretty straightforward. Turn off your phone at night. <laughs> How often do we wake up checking our emails or checking the news? The media is designed, and I'm in marketing, so the media and marketing is designed to govern your brain and take it over, <laughs> to infiltrate your brain. So what does it look like? And my wife and I have been doing this recently over the past few weeks. I turn off my phone after 9 p.m. I don't touch it until 8.30 a.m. So the first thing I do is I take my dog on a walk and I'm praying with God. So the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is not engage with what is happening in the world because there's so many crazy stuff happening. I'm not saying that we should engage with those things. There's so much crazy stuff happening. And instead I'm putting my phone away. I'm waking up and I'm engaging with God. And a couple other things is write down God's promises for you and follow up on it. I can't tell how many friends that I talk to. I'm like, hey, what's God's promises for you? If they ask me, hey, David, what are God's promises for you? And I forget. I forget because I don't write it down. I don't follow up on it. But I've been doing that more. Write down God's promises for you. And lastly, where is God inviting you to take risk? If you want to experience joy in 2019 and let joy be a primary driver and emotion in your life, take risk in your relationship with God. Some of you have lived such a life of comfort and security where there is zero risk taking. Zero risk taking. And we love you in that. But God, and I think the rest of us, are want, we want to invite you to step out and to take risks just as Elizabeth took risks. To name her baby John because that's what God said. So let's worship. And I will come back and pray together. About 12 years ago, I went on a trip to Southeast Asia and I prayed for a lot of blind and mute kids. And no one got healed. No one. During that time while I was in Southeast Asia, my dad called me and he told me, hey, your grandma broke five of her ribs. Can you just pray for her? And so I just prayed on the phone for my grandma and that was that. But during my, when, I was in, when I was in Thailand and Laos, no one got physically healed. I came home, back to San Diego, and about a week after getting back, my dad gives me a call, and he's just screaming in, in joy and excitement. My dad's not a believer. He's, he's screaming in joy and excitement. He's like, oh my God, David, your prayer worked. Your grandma went to the hospital after you prayed for her, and they checked up on her ribs, and everything was 110% than it was before. And I don't know what the heck I did. <laughs> I'm not some special healer or some magician of any kind. Um, but I think there's an invitation. But I just remember the joy in my dad's voice and the joy in my grandma's voice when I spoke with her on the phone. I think the kingdom of God is breaking through and he's inviting us in. And there's joy for us there. And he's inviting us to be people. So uh, prayer team, come on up. Um, if God's inviting you to just receive prayer um, about where areas of your life when you can be a person of joy, it really starts with looking at your schedule and how you're carving out time with God. And it also, also starts with where are you taking risks in your life? Like Elizabeth, where are you stepping out in faith and saying, even when the world is telling me this, I'm going to name my baby John. I'm going to name my baby John. So um, if that's you, if you feel like God's inviting you to take a risk, somebody, come up and receive prayer. We would love to pray for you. Um, at the end of every service, we hold hands and we close off. So um, let's grab a hand of someone next to you, and I'm going to pray for us. Get close. 
Squeeze the hand of the person that you're holding. Squeeze it. And I want you to say, we are going to be people of joy. Say it with me. We are going to be people of joy. Let's say it one more time. We are going to be people of joy. And Holy Spirit, I just bless this church. I bless this church to be risk takers. I bless this church to declare that their babies are going to be named John. <laughs> um, I mean, not like literally, but yeah, don't, I don't want a bunch of babies named John here. But, <laughs> but in faith. Would you open up your life to the Holy Spirit and would you cultivate your time with the Holy Spirit? And may you find joy in the everyday. In the everyday, anywhere where there's bias, anywhere where there's um, a certain way of seeing things, may God, may God illuminate your blind spots so you can grow in deeper relationship with God's purposes. Just as Zachariah was able to have his blind spot removed, even though he was mute through that. And God, I bless this church to be people of joy, to experience God and his purposes in all of its depth, going into Christmas, going to next year, going through all the hard seasons that you may be in. In the name of Jesus, I bless you to be people of joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, come up for prayer. If there's something that God's been speaking to you, we'd love to pray for you. Cool.